The Bible often uses the images of a shepherd and sheep for God and his people. It's an image that would have been readily understood in the day in which these words were written, but also readily understood even to this day. When we traveled throughout Israel, we saw shepherds with flocks of sheep or herds of goats everywhere. And I mean everywhere, including a shepherd with his goats grazing inside the clover leaf of a major highway in the city. And I still don't know how he got them there or how he got them out of there, but they really are everywhere. And there's lots of ways in which this parallel with God or Jesus as the shepherd and us as the sheep applies. Jesus is our good shepherd. We're individual sheep. We're his sheep. Together we're the flock of his sheep. And he is our shepherd. Before we read the passage where Jesus talks about this tonight, it's important to understand two kinds of sheep pens that were used and still are. One is a circular pen that would be constructed of stones, rocks, piled up to make kind of a wall. And on top of there would be, they would put briars to ensure that no one would get in or over the top of it. It's kind of like we do today. We want to put up a security fence and make sure nobody gets over. We'll put barbed wire fence along the top of it. Well, that's what they did using briars or thorns in Jesus' day. The other option was they used caves. They didn't have to build them. They would be already there. Now, the pens that they constructed would be used either in the villages where they would keep their, their flocks at night before taking them out to pasture again, or else out in open areas if they were far enough away from home that they couldn't get back in the evening. But as they're traveling up and down from the plateaus, down into the valleys, and that sort of thing, they would use caves because it was a natural place for them to use. We saw lots of examples of that to this day. Right inside the door of the cave, there were ashes where they had built a little fire to keep the, the smoke going out, but give some warmth on cold nights. We saw the sheep droppings throughout the cave. So we knew that they had been there, and some of them very recently. Both of these holding places for the sheep had one thing in common. They would have one single opening, only one way in and one way out, and that would have been guarded by the shepherd. You couldn't have several places to get in and out because you couldn't have control of the sheep, and the shepherd needed that. So with that background, listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 10. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. A watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he is brought out all his own, he goes out ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me 
It's that I lay down my life. Only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down to my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But the words of our God abide forever. So let's unpack what Jesus is teaching here. Starting with the fact that of the importance of the gate as the single entrance and exit to the sheep pen or to the cave. That use of a single entrance or exit gives the shepherd control of who gets in and who gets out. Sheep are going to wander. They're not interested in their safety. If they're hungry, they'll go looking for something to eat. If they're thirsty, they'll go looking for something to drink. They'll just wander. But the shepherd can keep them in the pen by using one entrance, one exit. In the same way he can keep predators from coming in or getting in. He says those who try to get in in other ways have bad intentions. If they're trying to get in, but they're unwilling to go through the door, they're probably a thief trying to steal the sheep, or they're a wolf or a mountain lion trying to climb in over the wall, get in some way, so they can devour the sheep. He said, they don't have the interests of the sheep in mind. They've got their own interests. <coughs> and what he's teaching here, as he says, those are thieves and robbers, is that those who want the benefits of Christianity on their own terms have corrupt intentions. He said, they're thieves. They're, they're robbers. They want forgiveness. They want acceptance from God. They want the benefits of an eternity. They want to know that there's somehow a life after death so that there's more than just this. But they're unwilling to go through Jesus. They want it on their own terms, in their own ways. They don't want to accept the claims that Jesus is making. He talks about the importance of the shepherd being the gate. And literally, that's how a shepherd would function. If they were using a cave, they would make sure that the entrance to that cave was not a wide one. They would only use one that was narrow enough so that at nighttime, the shepherd could lay across that entrance and no one could get around it. If they built a sheep pen, they would make sure that the doorway, the gateway to that pen was narrow enough that the shepherd could again lay down during the night and sleep there. He functioned literally as the gate to the pen. So any predator coming in or any sheep trying to get out would have to go over him or through him. And many times the very presence of the shepherd would scare any other wild animals from trying to get in to the sheep. They wouldn't have to take that chance of doing battle with the shepherd. And if the sheep got disturbed, if they smelled an enemy, if, if fear was a part of them during the night, and they started running around within the cave or within the sheep pen, the shepherd would instantly wake up. He would know that. And he would be there to kind of calm them down. In the daytime, he'd get up, open the doorway, allow the sheep to go out. He would lead them out so that they could get pasture, so that they could get water. But at night, he would bring them back in for their safety. And he would again lay down in front of that entrance, and he would be the gate. Jesus says in verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Jesus is making a very bold claim that he himself is the single gate, the single door, the single entrance way for sheep to get into the sheep pen. And Jesus very clearly and very consistently taught this truth without any exception. Jesus doesn't allow for any other ways. Jesus does not value all religions equally. Jesus is raised a Jew. He understands the Jewish traditions. He knows how the Jews live. He knows how important it is to them to live a moral lifestyle. But he consistently says to them, that's not enough. Because you can have a perfect lifestyle, but I know what's inside. He said, you're like a whitewashed grave. You look great on the outside. Your lifestyle is pure. It's perfect. It's moral. 
But inside, you still have your corrupt nature. And so he's saying to them, this is the only way to deal with that. John 14, 6, he says it so clearly. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the gate, the single gate. I am the only way. Jesus draws a very clear line in the sand. It says the only way to an eternal relationship with God the Father is to come through me. Let's go on. He talks about the importance of voice recognition. And if you're a parent, you understand this. Jesus said the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. If you're a parent and you have a child playing with 20 other children, and all of a sudden, one of the children starts screaming out in pain or fear. You instantly know whether or not it's your child. Because you know your child's cries. You know your child's voice. In the same way, if a child is upset, they're in a room with lots of other kids and lots of other adults, other adults can go to them and talk to them and they're not going to calm down. But when mom and dad comes and they hear mom or dad's voice, they instantly want their parent. There's that voice recognition. But Jesus says that's true with sheep and shepherds. It's true with Jesus and his followers. I know as a dairy farmer it was true. I could call our cows out of the pasture and they would come. Our neighbor's cows would be right across the fence. They wouldn't pay any attention. They didn't recognize my voice. Our animal's dead. That's the, the parallel that Jesus is making here. So here's a question for us. How do we discern the voice of our shepherd? How do we know when it's God that's speaking to us rather than someone else? A couple of tests. God's voice will always be consistent with Scripture. God cannot and will not contradict himself. If God is speaking to us, it will never be inviting us, calling us, challenging us, encouraging us to do something that is contrary to what's in Scripture. God's word in his voice cannot contradict his word in the Bible. That's why it's so important to know what's in this book. That's why it's so important to read and study this book. Because the more we understand what's in the Bible, the more likely we are to discern God's voice when he speaks to us. God's voice will always be consistent with our best interest. Now God may call us into something that's going to stretch us far greater than we want to be stretched. But he will never call us to our harm. He will never call us to harm anyone else. It's always for our best interest and the best interest of those who are around us. God is consistent in that way. But one of the realities is, if we want to hear God's voice, we have to spend quiet time with God. We have to get apart and listen. We have to get away from all the other noises and all the other voices. Scripture says, be still. Be quiet, be calm, settle yourself, center yourself, and know that I am God. So we have to be willing to, to get aside so we can hear that God may be speaking. We also have to be willing to follow his leading. If God speaks to us and we hear, but we reject what he's saying, if we refuse to do it, or if we continually ignore what he's saying, He's going to stop speaking. Well, he's going to continue speaking, but we'll get harder and harder of spiritual hearing that way. Because we're not willing to do what he calls. Why should he continue to speak to us if we're going to ignore what he says? We really can learn to hear his voice, to discern his voice. And yes, it takes some time. Again, it's like that child growing up, discerning the voice of a parent. 
So it is spiritually. The other part of this is how does the shepherd know our voice? How does God know when we're calling out to him? Well, scripture says he knows because he formed us. He understands who we are. He's adopted us. He's called us. He's bought us to be his sheep. And so he wants to know our voice. In fact, he not only listens to our spoken prayers, he listens to our heart cries. Psalm 139.4 says, Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. God knows what I'm going to say before I even think about what I'm going to say. God knows my anguish, my frustrations, my doubts, my fears, my questions, when I can't even formulate words to express that. God knows. He hears me. He listens to me. He intuitively knows exactly that it's me and not somebody else. That's how much he loves me. Jesus also points out here that it's pretty important that we realize that there are enemies. There are evil forces that would steal us away from the shepherd, that intend us harm. This world is not a neutral place. It's not like there's a blank slate and whatever we choose, then we'll get that. If we choose good, we'll get good. If we choose bad, we'll get bad. And everybody leaves us alone. We're in a world where there is much evil, where there is an evil one who has his own army of spiritual beings that are seeking to draw us away from God, that are seeking to destroy our faith, to devour us. And so it's important that we learn to discern other voices and run away from them. And that's not always easy because Satan is a master at disguising his voice. Scripture dis Right, Satan as being a roaring lion. Something we'd be terrified of. But he also can disguise himself in wonderful ways. He comes to Jesus when Jesus is undergoing temptation in the wilderness. And he quotes scripture to Jesus. He uses God's own word. He twists it. He takes it out of context. He tries to give it a different meaning. But he uses the very words of God to try to draw God's son away from him. And he will do the same for us. Now sheep are very skittish animals and sometimes we laugh about that. We don't like being compared to sheep. But the reality is sometimes we'd be much better off if we were a little more skittish. If we were a little more skeptical, a little less gullible. If we did question when something is being said, whether it's of God or not of God. And always to ask this question, is this what I'm hearing consistent with the nature and the character of God? Is this a true representation of who God is? That's one of the reasons we can say with, with religions that are based on making ourselves good enough and being good enough people so God will accept us, to say that's not consistent with Scripture. It's not consistent with the character of God. Because the character of God is to say to us, you're not good enough. You never will be. And I love you the way you are. And my son Jesus has taken care of that for you. So don't try to measure up. Accept my gift of grace. Jesus talks about the importance of the shepherd as the leader. The one who goes ahead of the flock and checks out the way. A good shepherd will never lead his flock of sheep into an area where the shepherd is not first gone. He won't take them to a new pasture unless he's checked it out to make sure it's all good grass and not poisonous weeds. He won't lead his sheep to a valley or up a mountain path unless he knows that there's safety there. But there's not dangers lurking everywhere. He won't lead them to drink of water unless he knows that water is pure and healthy for them. The shepherd goes ahead. He also holds the flock together. He cares for them as a group and not just individually. He places them within a group for their own good and their own safekeeping. 
It's so important for you and I to have the right shepherd. Because there are, again, wrong shepherds. Jesus says in verse 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for a sheep. And he draws the distinction between a hired hand and a shepherd who's an owner of the sheep. He says, if it's just a hired shepherd, and some wolf or other animal comes to attack the sheep, that shepherd's out of there. He's looking out for his own neck. He doesn't really care that much about the sheep. They belong to somebody else. It's just a job for him. Nothing more than that. But he says the owner of the sheep will lay down his life for his sheep. He'll protect them at any cost because they're his. They belong to him. It's like family. And he's saying, that's the kind of shepherd I am. I lay down my life for my sheep. I care. They are mine. He also makes this statement about the importance of other flocks. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. What does he mean by that? Well, certainly one of the things he can mean in our world, different churches, different denominations. He's saying, shepherd of them too. They're mine. But there's a clear distinction here. He's talking about different churches, different denominations who are Christian. Because other religions do not accept Jesus as a shepherd. He's not the shepherd of those who do not recognize him, who do not accept him in that role. What he says here about these other sheep and these other pens is that they're his responsibility and not ours. Sometimes we Christians can get all hung up because another church is doing something wrong or another denomination is believing something we don't believe and, and we're so quick to tear them down. What Jesus is saying here is, wait a minute, you're the sheep. That's not your responsibility. I'm the shepherd. I'm responsible to care for these sheep. Now, yes, sometimes he may give us a specific calling to be involved in, in sharing truth with others and and dialoguing and sharing what we believe and why and all that. But to simply go up and start tearing others down because they're different from us is not something given to us. In fact, unity is the goal of the shepherd. He said, I have other sheep, other pens. I'm the shepherd. And we will all be one. Disunity, dishonoring other shepherd or other sheep of the same shepherd is against his will. Jesus prayed that we would all be one. But there's only one way to get there. And that's through Jesus. It's through the good shepherd who is the door to the sheep. Let me close with a story. When I was in my teenage years, one week every summer, we would go to the Ottawa County Fair and show our dairy cattle through forage. Did year after year after year. One of the attractions at the Ottawa County Fair was the harness racing they had every night in front of the grandstand, night after night. And we loved that. We were teenagers. We weren't going to pay to get a ticket. There were other ways to get in. We knew that on the side of the grandstand, on one side was where the ticket stand was and the entrance and all that, and the other side of the grandstand was a, was a fence. And a guard there, and he'd be there for a while, but then he'd kind of walk through the grandstand, make sure everything was okay. So we'd wait till he went walking to the grandstand, we'd hop the fence, slide up into the stands, and enjoy the harness race. We were pretty proud of ourselves, but we were getting away with it. Until about the third night, we didn't know he knew what we were doing, but he did. The third night, he came up to us and said, I know what you guys are doing. Let me tell you this. I like 4-H. I like 4-H kids. But if you ever jump that fence again, I'm going to turn you in. And I'm not only going to make sure you don't come watch these harness races again. I'm going to make sure that you forfeit all your prize money. Now he had our attention. We were there to win prize money. It's a big deal for us. No more fence jumping after that. Because there were consequences. 
What Jesus is saying in this passage is, you can't jump the fence. You can't get into a relationship with an eternal God. You can't get into what we call heaven. You can't get into eternal life on your own terms. You can't take shortcuts. You can't jump the fence. Jesus is the doorway and the only doorway. He says, if you try to get in any other way, there are consequences, there are penalties. You forfeit the prize. But if you come through me, you don't even have to buy a ticket. I've already paid. I'm the doorway. I welcome you into my sheep pen. I will protect you, I will feed you, I will lead you, I will care for you. The one thing you have to do is come to me. If you've already done that, then give God thanks tonight. Appreciate the new and afresh the gift that you have been given. And if you haven't yet done that, then understand what clearly Jesus says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. <coughs> If you want to talk about it, if you've got questions, I'd love to do that. But understand what Jesus is saying. One door, one way, no best job. Let's pray. Father, in many respects, the hardest part of this is we have to humble ourselves. We're so used to doing things for ourselves, to taking control of our own life, handling the situations in front of us. And now you very clearly say, but you can't. And if you try, you're a thief and a robber. Come through me. Lord, thanks for that offer. Thanks for your grace and your goodness. <laughs> Honored we are to be known as your sheep. And Lord, if there are those 